Man, as fate would have it, would have it uh, we are continuing our, our series in the, in the book of James. And the book of James, uh, for those of you who are newer to church and newer to Christianity, James is a, a book that would only take about 15 minutes to read it. And it's so full of wisdom. James is like verse after verse, giving us so much practical stuff on how do we live our lives. And as we think about all the things going on in our world, in our city, um, I, I think about just this notion that there are so many times where I look myself in the mirror and I don't know what to do. And I think for us, in a lot of ways, we don't take full advantage of Scripture that seeks to be a resource for us to give us wisdom as Pastor Brandon talked about a couple of weeks ago, if anybody lacks wisdom, he should ask God because God gives wisdom to all without finding fault. Meaning that God is not like the friend that you call that if you haven't talked to them for a little while, when you first call them, they'll just remind you that you haven't reached out to them in a long time. And you don't want to call them because you're like, when I call them, it's going to be, I got to set aside 45 minutes because the first 15 minutes are all going to be about like problem solving for why I haven't hit them back. Scripture says that God gives wisdom to all who ask without finding fault, which means that when we go to God and ask God for wisdom, God is not holding over your head your prayerlessness or your previous ignorance. God is a, a free dispenser of wisdom. And James for us is this wisdom. Um, I, I think about so many times in my life where I wish I just had a friend that would tell me what to do. Uh, one of the things that I think stuck out to me after my grandmother passed away, my mother's mother, after she passed away, was that my mother would talk about how much she missed her mother in every way. But specifically, one way that stuck out to her was that my grandmother was like the source of wisdom in our family. And that when there were complex issues, we could just turn to grandma. And now that my mother, um, she's not older, she's, now that my mother has graciously acquired <laughs> additional years and beauty, and beauty. Yes, give it up for my mother, y'all. <laughs> uh, it still is complex and difficult to not be able to turn to her mother and ask for wisdom. But in some ways, in many ways, James for us, for the early Christians, was a source for the people who were experiencing so many different things. They faced challenging circumstances that had left many of them confused and discouraged. And James wrote to them to give them wisdom. He wrote to remind them of God's good purposes for their circumstances. He let them know that God offered reliable guidance that they should follow. And he assured them that if they would embrace the wisdom of God, they too would experience the joy that only God can provide. Now, wisdom is really necessary to embrace the complexities and to navigate the complexities of life. And one of the things as a pastor that I most grieve is when people try to distill super complex issues down to like slogans and sound bites. Now, what James offers us for today is wisdom. And here's what wisdom is. Wisdom is not the difference between right and, right and wrong. Wisdom is the difference between right and almost right. So what we're going to see today in James is um, a scripture that has been planned out months in advance for us, and it's wisdom for how you should live if you are a Christian. Now, really quickly, before we dive into it, uh, a lot of times in, at Renaissance, probably my favorite thing is that we have so many people who are newer to religion and newer to faith, newer to Christianity, newer to the world of the Bible, and you might not know whether or not you are a Christian or someone who follows Jesus right now. And I want to give you a little caveat before we dig into the, what James is telling us to do. Everything in James that tells us what to do is not so that you can become a Christian. So like if you do all of these things perfectly, it's not going to make you a Christian. You and I can be a Christian and in right standing with God because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. Jesus Christ, because he loves us, God in his great love for us, left eternity, entered humanity in the person of Jesus, went to the cross for our sins. And that for those of us who have placed our faith in Christ, we can now be reconciled and in good standing with God our Father based on nothing else beside that. And if we attach anything else to our faith, we are lowering the value of what Jesus has done for us. And as we're talking today about Jesus and faith, if you feel conviction in your heart, listen, I want you to um, come up after for prayer or to fill out a connection card to speak to one of our pastors. We would love to walk with you and what it means for you to place your faith in Christ. But for those of you who are already following Jesus, here's what James is getting at for us today. This wisdom will change your life. 
it will change our church. It might even change our city. And if it changes our city, I think it could change the world. But it won't change anything unless it first changes you. Now, this wisdom might be a little difficult to swallow at first, particularly because of just how polarizing everything is right now. Not just polarizing nationally, but locally. I was talking to someone the other day about um, just all of the, the drug use on the streets and like, what are we gonna do about it? And should there be more clinics and safe injection sites and what should happen, where should they be placed? And it just devolved to a really angry conversation and I was like, man, this is, it's very, very complex. So what do you do with all the complex situations in front of us? And here's what James tells us to do. And this is what's something that I, if we do this, I think it will make us compassionate, conviction-filled people that can lead the way forward. Here's what James tells us in James 1, verses 19 through 21. My dear brothers and sisters, understand this, everyone, not some, not some people, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Therefore, ridding yourselves, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, humbly receive the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Now, to everybody who went out last night and you got about three, four hours of sleep and you're about to take a nap now because we're in a nice, dimly lit auditorium, two things. One, I can see you when you fall asleep. <laughs> but two, before you take your nap, all I want you to remember from today is these three phrases. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. What should you do in your personal relationships? You should be really quick to listen. You should be slow to speak. You should be slow to anger. What should you do about all of the gun stuff going on in the country? You should be quick to listen. You should be slow to speak. You should be slow to anger. What should you do about the most polarizing issue of our time with abortion? You should be quick to listen. You should be slow to speak. You should be slow to anger. Now, what James gives us is wisdom that is difficult for us to hear. And I think for some of us, we discard James's wisdom here because we think about the most outlandish thing people would say or the most outlandish person, and we want to throw away the baby with the bathwater because of, in our minds, we can think of people in situations that nobody should listen to. Uh, yesterday on our ride out against gun violence, um, as we got close to Harlem Hospital, and um, Brandon and Malia set up uh, a vigil that we would do, that we would release balloons in the air uh, for people who have been lost to gun violence. And as we got our way close to Harlem Hospital, we were chanting, wheels up, guns down, and a man started yelling at us, I want more guns so we can kill more people. And clearly that brother had some issues. We should not have hopped off our bikes and said, you know what, James is telling us to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. <laughs> Brother, tell us, why should we have more guns to kill more people? Come on, tell us. There are some things and some people that are so outlandish, they're just trash opinions. And I don't think that James is telling you, you should fill yourself with trash opinions. Or, or we should allow anybody to speak into our lives. As one, another wisdom writer says in Ecclesiastes, he says this, don't pay attention to everything people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you. So which one is it? Should we be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, or should we not pay attention to everything people say? The answer is yes. <laughs> Wisdom is situational. We will find ourselves in situations where for a number of reasons, you might not want to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, but it is the most helpful thing for you. And you might find yourself in situations where the best, most godly thing you can do is to remove yourself from a situation so that you don't have a certain conversation. I could think of a person, uh, a number of people actually, that are just, in, in, that I know, and God loves them, I love them, they are extremely critical and judgmental. And as a matter of fact, I can't think of a time in the last couple of years that I've been around them and not felt worse about myself. Like I would, should not respond to every invitation from that person to hang out and let them speak into my life. I shouldn't call them after service to say how was the sermon or else I'd be devastated every single week. We do need boundaries. We need wisdom in terms of what are the things that we are allowing ourselves and availing ourselves to. So, as we think about this scripture and unpack it today, I don't want you thinking about the most ridiculous, terrible things that people say or the most harmful and destructive people and say, well, I shouldn't listen to them. I think scripture would agree with you. 
But all of us need to take this word to heart because 99% of the time, you need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. But that's not easy for us uh, for a number of reasons. Um, the first reason that is hard for Jordan is I'm prideful. My name is Jordan Rice, and I'm a recovering prideaholic. In my conversations, to be perfectly honest, I think what makes it so difficult for me to be quick to listen is that I already know I'm right. Like, I just, I, I, I joked about this a little bit last service. This sometimes I ask people questions, and I've already, I've already done the thing. Like, I've already set the wheel in motion. Like, hey, what do you, I'll talk to my wife, say, hey, do you think I should have tweeted this thing? And it's like, I tweeted it already. It's too late. It's out there. <laughs> Pride is so intoxicating. It feels so good. It puts me in the driver's seat. And when I am experiencing pride, it is impossible for me to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, because I already know I'm right, so I don't really want to hear what you have to say. And I'm actually very quick to speak because my opinion is better than yours, because I've already filled in the blanks of what you're going to say, even though I haven't heard it, and I've already deduced that what you're about to say is less good than what I'm about to say. Pride is a dangerous thing. Throughout the scripture, pride over and over again, is the greatest enemy of people. And humility is our best friend. God can do nothing with a prideful person. God can do a whole lot with people who have inconsistency issues, that have a whole lot of stuff going on in their lives. God can do a lot. As a matter of fact, the story of Scripture is a story of God using people who had all these flaws. But God can do nothing with a prideful person. There's a scripture in Psalms, which is so sobering. It says this in Psalm 10 and 4. It says that in his heart, in his mind, in his life, the prideful person, there is no room for God. There's no room for God because we're so full of ourselves. C.S. Lewis defines pride like this. Pride is the ruthless, sleepless concentration upon self. The worst part about pride is it's, it's really easy to see it in other people. It's super easy to see it in other people, but it's really difficult to see it in ourselves. And so we need the mirror of Scripture, God's perfect word that shows us ourself in real reality. We need the mirror of community, brothers and sisters who love us, who are not afraid to tell us difficult truths to show us the pride in our lives. And we need the humility to humbly say, God, I accept your words that convict me of my pride and these are the people that you put in my life to help me see my pride and to repent of our, of, the, of our pride. So sometimes we're not good listeners, and we're, we're quick to speak and not quick to listen because we're just prideful. Um, in your mind right now, this is like the litmus test if you're really prideful. This is like a really dangerous place to be. When I start talking about pride, if you start thinking about somebody else, like if your first thought was, yo, this dude Larry is like the worst. If you think about what your husband or your wife or your friend or your cousin did yesterday, that is a really dangerous place to be. Pride is like carbon monoxide. You don't know what's there until it's too late, until you're, until you're drowsy and you're just dozing to sleep. So the number one reason I think it's, which we struggle with the scripture in James is that we're just prideful people. Um, two, I think, I think we're ignorant. One of the things about Christianity that I've, I've come to learn over the years is that what it means to be born again, super deep spiritual term, means that we have been born again into a brand new family. And into a new family, there are new rules, new rules of engagement. The way that you used to operate should not be the ways that you operate now. And one of those areas is how you listen. Most of us growing up did not have really good examples of what does it mean to be a really good listener. I was talking to my wife last night, and I said, yeah, who do you know that's like a really good listener? And she was like, nobody. And I was like, you're going to look at my face <laughs> in the black of my eyes and not say me. We really don't have a lot of great examples of what it means to be a, a good listener. And I know this to be true because a couple of months ago, we did an exercise. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with emotional health and spiritual health and how it all intersects. And one of the things that I found to be really difficult, one of the most difficult things I've had to do was a listening exercise where I would ask Jessica questions, and the only thing I would do is repeat back what she said. And that was the worst five minutes of my life. I was miserable. 
because I kept on wanting to interject my opinion and say, okay, I heard you. I'm going to let you finish. But really quickly, hey, and that was just five minutes, five minutes in a controlled environment. So think about how bad of a listener I am when I'm not in a controlled environment where people are standing over my shoulder, making sure I'm being a good listener. Uh, in his book, um, uh, How to Negotiate, this one FBI, a former FBI agent talked about negotiating with um, criminals and terrorists. And he always talked about this concept that every time there's like this high stakes hostage situation, there are always multiple people on the phone call listening because one person is never sufficient to listen to like the hostage demands. They just miss out on stuff. And these are people who know how dire the situation is. They're being paid money to do this. And still that there are gaps in between what is being said and what they're actually listening to. If that is something that's, that's true, think about how much in your own life you don't really listen to people. So we're never really quick to listen because we don't know how to listen. Here's what I want you to do as you think about uh, the conversations you're going to have today, this week, this month, personally, with your friends, family, coworkers, people you disagree with. Have you truly heard the person? And how do you know that you've heard the person? What they're actually saying? What I would recommend that you do is, one helpful thing that I do, especially when I sense myself getting a little angry or sense myself getting a little prideful wanting to respond very quickly, is I will repeat back to them what they just said. And then I will allow myself to feel the reality of what they just said. Instead of justifying, correcting, I just want to, at this point, feel what they just said to me in that moment. So take that for what it's worth. Um, I think it's really helpful uh, as we seek to be people who are quick to listen. I think we need to practice because the muscle of listening for us is like really, really, really weak. And you'll know how weak it is when you actually start to try to listen to people, um, to truly hear what they're saying. Not to correct them, not to guide them, but just to hear what they're saying. The last thing is, I think we're just fragile sometimes. Uh, we don't want to admit it, but we're not quick to listen um, because we're fragile. When, when someone offers constructive criticism of us, when someone corrects us, we're just too fragile to receive the, the correction. And so we respond with uh, an immediate pushback. So whether it's pride, whether it's ignorance that we don't know how to listen, or whether it's fragility, um, I think we need to be honest with ourselves and think, think that if we are going to be the people that God is calling us to be, if we're going to navigate this world, we need to be people who are quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. So James says this, my dear brothers and sisters, everyone understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to, to anger. As I thought about this scripture, one of the things that stuck out to me was that in my life, pride is always enticing and patience is always underrated. Have you ever wondered that in your life? That so many people want to be more patient? but none of us are. I've never had a, a, a time where I pray for people in the front of the service and they say, oh yeah, patience, I got that. I got that down pat. I need some other stuff. Isn't it interesting that we're so, we're so impatient? Why do you think that is? In part, I think it's because patience is truly underrated. And we don't see the value of what it looks like to engage, again, in complex issues with patience. Now, this is not to diminish or to dismiss their urgent needs of the things that we are talking about today, like gun violence for being one thing, for, for, as an example. I'm not saying that we should be ignorant or unaware of the needs that are, that are happening, but I was listening to a podcast this week, um, and one of the speakers was uh, the senator from Connecticut, the man who was involved in the Sandy, uh, not he wasn't involved, he was a senator in, in Connecticut when the Sandy Hook shooting happened, and he was talking about the deal that the Congress just passed to uh, the first historic deal in over 30 years to have some sort of gun reform. And he was talking about, well, of course this is not everything I wanted, but this is a step in the right direction. And one thing that I've thought about, that I've, I've thought about in my own personal life, that I don't always apply to larger situations, it's this. Direction is always more important than speed. The direction that we're going in is always more important than speed. You can be going really fast in the wrong direction. And while I would like for there to be more progress in different things, I think patience is really underrated. And for us to be people who actually see things change over time, if you were to look back to American history, the people who actually saw like real change, 
They didn't get it overnight. And one of my fears in our instant uh, gratification culture, Amazon, Twitter, like everything happens so quickly that we have been discipled to expect everything that must happen needs to happen now, just because we said it with exclamation points. And that's not the way the world works. So James en encourages us and challenges us to be slow to speak, uh, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, uh, and to not underrate patience and what it does. And then James continues with a, a part of the scripture that for some of you might be kind of hard to hear because you're angry now. Uh, he says this, for human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. After Uvalde, I was ready to throw my phone out the window. I said, if I see one text, one tweet with thoughts and prayers, I'm going to fight somebody. I was so, 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 so mad. And what James gives us is a little bit of a warning. He says, human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Now, Jesus in Scripture got angry. There's one Scripture in John 2 where it says Jesus made a whip out of cords and drove the money changers out, the, out of the temple, turned over tables. Anger is good. Anger is a God-given emotion. But what James is drawing a contrast uh, in between is human anger and God's anger. God's anger is anger at injustice, to reveal injustice and a wrong that needs writing. This anger should be around every time we see the loss of life. But the scripture tells us that anger should not be your first emotion or the most dominant emotion about you because that's not the most important thing about God. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, as it says in Psalm 103. And that scripture is actually repeated over and over and over again, seven times in scripture. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Now, if you were to read through the Bible, you would see that God, anger is not God's first emotion. And unlike my anger, which is usually full of incomplete information and self-righteousness, God's anger is perfect and pure and full of his other generous attributes of compassion, grace, and love. So what James is talking about is, the, is not God's anger, but it's this chronic anger that really does negatively impact us. And so many people, they're not quick to listen or slow to speak because they are quick to anger. And I don't think that there's any way forward without listening to what James is telling us to do. There's no way forward in your personal relationships. Listen to this. As you are thinking about navigating the difficult people in your life, you will irreparably harm your relationships if you are not quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. If Renaissance seeks to be a body of people that offer help to a confused and hurting world, we will not be worth our weight in salt unless we are quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger because Human anger does not produce God's righteousness. Human anger is destructive anger. Destructive anger is not concerned about the wrong anymore. Destructive anger is now rooted and pointed at the person through whom we are angry at. So now we've lost sight of the cause, and now we're just angry at the person. There's a scripture in the book of Esther, and Esther is a phenomenal book. And it tells a story about a man named Haman. And Haman was this guy who was like number two to the king in command. And Haman had a problem with anger, and Haman's anger blinded him. There's one scripture in, in Esther 3 and 5. It says that when Haman saw that Mordecai was not bowing down or paying him homage, he was filled with rage. And so, because of his rage, he, when he learned of Mordecai's ethnic identity... It seemed repugnant to Haman to do just away with Mordecai alone. He planned to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout Ahasuerus' kingdom. So Haman makes this plan that he is going to devise a way that he is going to kill Mordecai and do away with all of Mordecai's people. Haman swings for the fences. In his blind rage, now he is no longer okay with just doing away with Mordecai, he wants to hurt and harm everybody associated with Mordecai. 
Haman makes some plans, and he devises this plan that he's going to go to the king and ask for Mordecai to be hanged. So Haman has his people build a gallow uh, to hang Mordecai 75 feet high. And because of Mordecai's blind rage, he misses out on so many things. He misses out on the fact that the queen is herself a Jew. He wasn't paying attention because he couldn't have paid attention. He couldn't have noticed because he was filled with rage and anger. Chronic, destructive anger blinds us. It's no longer about the thing anymore. It's about the person that you want to see destroyed. And Scripture says in, ha- in Esther 7 and 10, then they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's anger subsided. Now, the story of Esther and Haman is, is, is one that for some of you, you'll say, wow, that's an interesting story, but that has no application to my life. Uh, one of the most difficult topics to talk about in church is that of forgiveness. People think that forgiveness is weak. People think that forgiveness is letting people go with stuff. And I've seen people spend decades miserable because they held on to unforgiveness against someone else. They harmed themselves because of their bl- blind rage as to um, what someone else had done to them. Now, forgiveness is not just excusing things. It's not just allowing a person to continue to hurt you. It's none of those things. But forgiveness is releasing the debt. And so many of us, because of our anger, we harm ourselves in the process by holding on to unforgiveness, sometimes for decades, and the other person not even thinking about you. We harm ourselves because of our anger. And what James is saying is correct. Human anger does not produce God's righteousness. It doesn't produce God's righteousness righteousness in your life, And it certainly doesn't produce it in your relationships. And it certainly will not produce it in our church and in our world. So we need to be very careful about how how anger limits our ability to see um, and see things properly as they ought to be. Another thing I've really been fascinated with about anger is just how limiting it is in our lives. Um, Have you ever noticed that if you're like really, really angry about something, you can't even really think about solutions anymore? You can't even think about solutions. Your creativity is out the window. Your plan of restoration is blank. Because blind, just this rage that we have that dominates us uh, really does limit us in our ability to truly um, see things as they are and really to move forward. So we should be feeling our, the anger that we feel. We should be unearthing this, not suppressing it, right? We talked about emotions in general that uh, emotions are like kids on vacation. You shouldn't put them in a driver's seat or in the trunk, right? They have to be in the car with you. But we shouldn't give them access to the driver's seat, and we certainly shouldn't try to stuff them back in the trunk. But the, the most, I think, dangerous reason and the most profound reason that James is saying that you and I need to be people who are quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, because anger, human anger does not produce God's righteousness, is because chronic anger really is rooted in a forgetfulness. I was talking to Dr. Sarita Lyons. She's one of the most profound speakers that I've really ever heard. And she's a psychotherapist and an attorney. Um, And she was talking about chronic anger and the anger that just burns through us and is an anger that is fueling us. And she talked about the people who live with chronic anger really are living as functional atheists. What does that mean? It means that even though you profess Jesus with your lips, you're living like God is not in control, that God is not a judge who will, uh, that God is not just, and that God will judge the world, and that nobody is going to get away with anything. Here's what scripture tells us in uh, Hebrews 4 and 13. It says, no creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of whom we must give an account. A lot of times, we're so filled with anger because we think that people are going to get away with the grave injustices of our day. We think they're going to get away with it. And the only way we feel like we can penalize them is by being really consumed with with anger. It's because we're forgetful that God is a judge, that God is just. God is holiness. God is righteousness. God doesn't just have righteousness. God is righteousness. You know, growing up, I think about the the ways in which if you trusted that God was just and that God was a judge and that God was going to have the final say, it would allow us to not be consumed with anger. 
My mother is the sweetest person in, uh, in this room. She just had a birthday this past Friday, and uh, we gave her a lot. Yes, please. And in a lot of the affirmations, on birthdays, what we do in my family is we practice affirmations. We speak into the life of the person. And my mother is, is so sweet and so full of love. And it kind of made it difficult for her to discipline me and my brother growing up. We would pretend like her little pinches hurt, uh, and we would really be wilding out. But there is something that she would say that would, like, shift the entire mood. She'd say, that's okay. Wait till your father gets home. <laughs> and she would be calm after that, like, oh, no, no, keep doing that. Let your room stay dirty. It's fine. Wait till your father gets home. She was able to be calm because she knew enforcement was going to happen. <laughs> I wonder if we're so consumed with anger sometimes because we don't think that there's an enforcer. We don't think that God is truly just. We don't think that God is truly going to have the final say. So we feel like we have to manufacture it on our own. I'll end with this. One of my heroes is a woman named Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer was a civil rights activist um, really in charge of helping to register droves and droves of black people to register to vote in the Deep South. And Fannie Lou Hamer endured more probably in a week than you and I have thought about in our entire lives. She suffered incredible amounts of threats and violence, both physically and sexually. And there's one story about Fannie Lou Hamer after she was uh, thrown in jail for registering black people to vote in the Deep South. And as the story would go, she was sexually assaulted by one of the police officers while in custody from that officer. And when she got out, every one of us would have felt like she was justified if she just had anger that burned a hole through her and that person. She walked to the officer and she said, calmly, have you ever wondered what you're going to say when you stand before God and you have to give an account for what you did to me? What fueled Fannie Lou Hamer and what I hope fuels me, and what I hope fuels you, is a confidence and an assurance that doesn't let us dismiss the realities of our world, but it trusts that God is the one who's going to have the final say. So for you, in your personal relationships, may you be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. As we navigate all of the things going around in our city and in our country, may you be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. God, our Father, I pray that um, as we consider the complexity of your word to us today, Lord, I pray that it will be received with the grace that it was intended to be received. Lord, if we are upset, I pray that it would unsettle us and remove the parts of our lives that have no basis being there in the first place. Lord, I pray that it would be full of assurance that you are good, you are righteous, you are holy, you are trustworthy. I pray that when we feel overwhelmed, we would turn and run to you, the one who understands all, knows all, feels all, and welcomes us to yourself. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.